The background you can see here is actually the faculty's excavation project, which is at Interamna Lurena. So if you want to Google it or follow it on the project on Instagram. But this is basically located about halfway between Rome and Naples um, in kind of central southern Italy. And I got involved in this project as a first year undergrad. So I do recommend it's a lot of fun. Um, if you end up doing something classics related at uni, definitely have a look to see if your uni offers uh, a dig project because they're a huge amount of fun. And the reason I have this as my background is not only because we had to get up really, really early, you can see the sunrise here um, to kind of avoid the heat, but also because in uh, kind of this section, you can see, maybe you can't see actually because it's very dim, but here basically there's a, a big pit that we dug um, and in there we found a Roman sundial. Um, so we'll come to that later, but basically where we found it was along uh, here, and this is actually a Roman road that has now been fully excavated. This, does anyone know what this is? Can anyone guess? It's an amphitheatre. It's not an amphitheatre, but it's a theatre. It's half an amphitheatre, right? So it's a theatre. Um, so here you can see some of the seats still remain, but not all of them. But here we have at the back a, a road, and over here um, we probably would have had the forum. So the fact that we found the sundial here, probably it would have been in the forum, we'll see why later, but probably when the, the town was destroyed, someone grabbed it, thought, oh, maybe I can reuse it, was carrying it down the road, then thought, Christ, this thing is heavy, I'm not carrying it, I don't really need it, and just dumped it, left it there for us to find thousands of years later. Um, so that's kind of the background to how we found it. Um, has anyone, like, hands up if you've seen the kind of sundials that I've got on the left? Yeah, okay, fantastic, fantastic. What about the ones on the right? Okay, a few less. These are kind of more medieval-y. You'll see them on, like, yeah, older buildings. Lots of Oxbridge colleges have them, um, if you look closely enough. What about this? Hands up, have you seen something like this? Whereabouts? I'm really curious. Museums or yeah, okay. So this is completely bizarre and wacky. When we found it, we had absolutely no. It's about this big, um, really, really heavy. It took kind of six of us to kind of lift it about a meter up in the air to get it in a van and out the site. Um, so a huge kind of a huge contraption. Um, and completely unlike anything that we've seen. You'll also notice it has one inscription here and the other, which I'll show you back later, another inscription here. So this made it one of eight sundials in Italy that from this from the Roman period that have an inscription. So super, super uh, interesting. Um, but in order to understand how this actually tells the time, the crucial bit missing, which is, is called the gnomon, and it's basically a metal spike, and it's the shadow of this metal spike that shows you what the time is. So that would have been attached to the very top. You can see there was like a chunk of metal still there, but the actual spike um, had snapped off. Um, so this is, yeah, this is how we found it, and you'll see a, a much younger version of me there. Um, so as you can see, completely kind of covered in rubble and buried under the earth. So how does it actually work? So this is the bit I was talking about that um, uh, is actually missing at the moment and you can see its shadow. So this had to face south. It needs to be in a wide area. So that's why I said the forum is probably the most likely because it couldn't have the shadows of other buildings falling on it. Otherwise you wouldn't be able to see the spiked shadow on the dial face. Then it would have probably also been up in the air. So for example, um, on a column, if anyone's been to Pompeii, they've kind of stuck one on a column um, at some point. So if you're walking around, if you do get the chance to go to Pompeii in the future, um, keep an eye out for it because it's it's quite cool and probably is an accurate idea of what it what it would have looked like um, in order for it to function as a as a sundial. So as the sun rose in the east, basically um, this guy's shadow would have started on this side of the dial and moved like this. Is actually, really good doing it with this wall and moved, so at midday it would have been down here, and then as the sun set in the west, it would come round the other side of the dial face. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. But this is actually a lot less clever than modern sundials, 
because if you think about it, um, when the sun is highest in the sky, it's pointing down at the sixth hour, okay? So this has 12 hours, okay? In a summer's day, which is a lot longer, if you take all the daylight in a summer's day and just split it into 12 equal parts, that's not going to be 60 minutes. That's not our hour. It's going to be more like 80 minutes. If you take the shortest winter day of the year and do exactly the same, split it into 12 equal parts, that's going to be more like 40 minutes. You with me? Okay, right. So basically what I'm saying is that Romans didn't have 60 minute hours. For them, there were always 12 hours in the day, in a daylight day, and there were always 12 hours at night. But their daylight hours and their night hours were different lengths. So in the summer, their daylight hours were really long and their winter hours were really short. And in the winter, the other way around. So we've got a chart to kind of illustrate that, which I won't play for too long because it will make us all dizzy. But basically, if we pause it, you can see that in the winter, so January, your daylight hours at the bottom are very short and your winter hours are very long. Whereas if we try and do exactly the same thing in the summer, our daylight hours are very long and our winter hours are very short. Okay, so completely different to our uh, time system. People in the ancient world knew this, they were aware with it, and they were completely fine with it because they didn't know anything better. Um, you find in Roman comedy, there's a play by a guy called Plautus, and uh, one guy accuses another of being able to drink loads in an hour. Um, and this guy replies, yeah, I can finish that wine not just in a summer's hour, but I bet you can. I, I I bet you I can also finish it in a winter's hour. So he's playing on this idea of, you think I can just do it in eighty minutes, but actually I can do it in half the time. So this is very much part of everyday life. So let's have a quick look at the inscription because this is kind of one of the reasons. There are about 80 sundials found in Roman Italy, but as I said, about only 10% of them have inscriptions. So this is what made it um, really quite interesting. So here we have the name of the guy who set it up. So we have Marcus, Marcus Novius, and then his son, is here, Tubula, and his son, Filius of Marcus, so his dad's called Marcus as well, very inventive Roman names. And then at the top, we're told TRPL, which is Tribunus Plebis. So he is Tribune of the Plebs, which is basically kind of representative of, of the people. Um, and this was some, uh, this was an, a kind of minor political office held in Rome. So this is quite interesting already because we have a guy setting this up in a small town outside Rome, um, but he's celebrating his political status, his political office in the capital city. So already quite interesting. And then we've got this formula, which we find on a lot of um, Roman dedications, D et pec, dedit sua pecunia, which is gave his cash, okay? So what is going on here is that he's put up a sundial, he's stuck his name on it. It was probably painted so you could see it in big letters. And he says, hello, everyone. This is something I paid for, and this is my name, and this is my rank. OK, so I think we can already start to see what's going on here. And what's going on is something very similar to what we see in our modern and medieval world as well. So we see people um, who have money to spare giving back to society and celebrating that by kind of putting their name on things. Um, we also have kind of sponsorship, if you look at this bottom one. And um, uh, th this actually is no longer going ahead with the Oxford College changing their name. But I thought this was a really interesting um, idea that still in our, our modern day world, if someone pays for something, they'll have their kind of name put on the building. Um, as you're going around Cambridge, you'll probably find that there are loads and loads of student accommodations in different colleges called Crips. And this guy was basically a big um, donor at the time when a lot of these accommodations were built. So you still have this practice of um, putting your name on things, advertising yourself in this way, and um, giving back to society um, in a way that 
made people appreciate you. You know, you weren't just dedicating a school, but the school was named the Dominique Goddard School. So everyone could remember that it was you who gave the money for it. So really in the rest of this talk, I want to explore why this guy, Tubula, decided to use a sundial. In the Roman world, benefaction was really, really common. Um, how society worked is that it wasn't that the people with a lot of money were taxed and this money was then kind of redistributed through society. It didn't work like that at all. Instead, you had a patron and client relationship where people who were the elite of society needed everyone else to keep them in power and keep voting for them um, and uh, keep following them. So what you had is they had to have something in return. So um, the clients of, the, of society would have also gone to their patron if they had problems um, and their client would have then helped them sort out their problems and, and so on. So you have this kind of relationship where different parts of society are dependent on each other. Um, and in this context, benefaction was really important because if you had a little bit of extra money, you could uh, dedicate something that helped the people and maybe increase the amount of clients that you had. And therefore also kind of increase your local power as a, as a kind of local politician. Um, so in the Roman world, we see people uh, donating kind of bath complexes, Theatres, we think the theatre at Interamna was uh, donated by actually a, a freedman. So someone who had been a slave beforehand had freed and then had made a lot of money and could donate something to the town. So we see this kind of thing in, um, in the Roman world all the time. But why did he choose a sundial? So to do this, we're going to go through um, kind of the different sources we have for the ancient Roman world uh, about timekeeping. The first one here is about elite timekeeping. So if we read Cicero, he says that if you're really bored watching a trial, you can just send someone to go and check a sundial. OK, now this sounds kind of, you know, something you've taken, you might take for granted, but actually it's quite interesting. Probably the towns were kind of full of these dials and you could um, just walk around, find the nearest square and you'd see one in there, kind of like a big town clock. Um, but I found what was really interesting was this, which we find in one of his letters to his freedman, Tyro. And he is about to go to the countryside and he says, should I send my sundial ahead of me? And obviously here he's not talking about one of these kind of big stone sundials, but he's talking about something that looked a bit more like this, a portable sundial. So this is really interesting that some of the um, elite in society did have these kinds of dials. Um, which they could kind of take from one place to the other. Often they have a kind of location um, uh, um, setting. There we go. A location setting. So you could set it to different towns or different countries sometimes. So you can imagine that merchants use these as well. So if you were a traveler and you traveled around the empire selling things, something like this might come in handy. Um, sometimes they are really, really bizarre. Has anyone, does anyone know what this, this is a portable sundial, it's only small. It's found in Herculaneum, um, which is quite near Pompeii. If you end up ever going to visit Pompeii, I would recommend going to see Herculaneum. It's smaller, but really, really nice. Um, and this was found there. Can anyone, does it, does the shape remind you of anything? You don't really see them much. Yeah, yeah, shout out. Yeah, I can see that. It's not, a, they have identified it as something else, especially on the basis of this weird thing here. Um, you don't really see them much in the UK, but you know, palm, like Palmer ham, okay? They slice Palmer ham from something that looks like this. So if you go to um, Bologna or like some towns in Italy where ham is, is really common and famous for that region, you'll find these big legs of ham um, of cured ham kind of hanging in the windows. And so this they think is meant to be a ham, which makes this, which is the gnomon, the thing that shadow tells you the time, that makes this the pig's tail. So really, really weird um, and very, very inventive. So here we see Romans 
not just having these kind of portable sundials, but also playing around with them, making them personalized. Perhaps this belonged to someone who traveled around selling ham, or perhaps this, you know, belonged to someone who just really liked bacon. Um, so I think this is quite interesting. You start to get a bit of personality. Okay, some graphs. So just going to go through this really, really briefly. Um, in this chart on the side, on the left-hand side, you can see a huge spike in the amount of sundials dedicated in the first century AD, which is going to tie in in a minute to some of my uh, other points. But I think sometimes when we look at charts like this, it's really easy to think, okay, great, people were really interested in sundials in the first century AD, but then after that, they weren't very interested because look, like the amount of um, sundials actually being set up massively decreases. Okay, yes, absolutely fine. But if we think about it, these stone sundials, a lot of them we're still finding pretty much intact and well-preserved 2000 years later. So it wasn't that they stood for 10, 20, 50, 60 years. We can expect that they might have stood in a town for much longer than that. So if we think about this in cumulative terms, in terms of if you went into a Roman town, how many sundials would you actually see? What we can do here is we can basically kind of add on the bars. Um, so this is obviously very rough. Some would have fallen down and not been restored, but I think this gives us a more accurate idea of what Roman towns would have looked like in this later period. So it wasn't that in the second century, people just stopped dedicating them because they weren't interested in them. It was probably because the town already had one. And how many sundials do you actually need? So something else that interested me when I uh, was looking at sundials is that obviously sundials only work if it's sunny, right? So how interested were Romans really in timekeeping if they could only tell the time when the sun was out? And I know that in Italy it's more sunny than here, but still they did have they do have cloudy days. So I looked a little bit more at precision in timekeeping, and basically if Romans wanted to be precise and also um, have an hour that wasn't variable from, um, from winter to summer, they often use water clocks. Um, we have a good story from Marshall, who tells us that um, there's a lawyer giving a really, really boring speech. And he says, come on, please just drink from the water clock. So drink from something like this, which basically functions like an egg timer. Uh, drink from the water clock so you can rest your voice so we don't have to hear you anymore and also so you can reduce the amount of time that you have remaining to talk because the idea was in the law courts that both sides would have had the same amount of time to speak um, uh, so that the trial was fair. Uh, we have another piece of literary evidence from Caesar who tells us that on military campaign in Gaul his um, soldiers would use water clocks to measure their night shifts. And this basically meant that everyone would have the same shift time. So, you know, my shift didn't have to be longer than, than your shift. And this was really useful during the night because obviously they couldn't tell uh, the time in any other ways. Um, Romans are also very obsessed with time for astrology. So it's very important to know what time of, what time of the night your child was born, because then you can, uh, accurately pre uh, predict their horoscope, maybe choose a name that fits them. So you find this sometimes as well um, in ancient texts, which I think is quite is quite fun. Um, and then something else which I I found in the the ancient texts, which was quite interesting in terms of precision, was Marshall telling us about his daily routine. So he sets out, you can see it here, I don't need to read it out, but he sets out his daily routine and his, his day is kind of split by the hour. He has an hour in the evening to go to the gym. Um, he, at the first two hours of the day, for all his clients, his clients to come into the house and for him to, to mingle and socialize with them and for them to bring him any problems that, um, that they might have. And then the uh, final, the 10th hour, the final hour he mentions he says, and in the 10th hour, the emperor will be reading my book of epigrams. So, you know, really backing himself there. But 
realistically in the ancient Roman world, this kind of kind of precise division of hours for your day was probably only for people like Marshall. So only really for members of the elite who um, might have had this kind of rigid schedule and had these portable sundials so they could be uh, a lot more interested and obsessed with time than um, someone else. For example, if you're a farmer working in the fields, then when it's light, you can go and work in the fields. When it's dark, you can't. So I think, you know, this, this kind of evidence should be taken with a pinch of salt. Um, as always, the literature that comes down to us is of a very small subsection um, of uh, ancient society. So no, by no means representative of the whole of Roman society, but we definitely get a feel that some members of the society are, are really interested in this kind of stuff. But sundials are also interesting um, in a kind of symbolic way. So we find this is, I think it's in the Naples Museum now, but it was found in a villa in Pompeii. <clears throat> and it's called the Seven Sages Mosaic. So it's got all these philosophers and surrounding them up here, you can see a sundial very much like the one we found in Taramna. Um, down here, uh, I think it's called an astrolabe. It's like a celestial globe, which is also used for um, something similar. And here, some people have said they might be water clocks. Um, so the philosophers surrounding the sundial I think gives us this kind of idea that this might have been seen as something scientific or high tech. Um, so this is gives us maybe an idea of why Tubula, this guy, set up this sundial, because maybe the local people had never seen one before in, in the first century, which is when we, we think it was it was set up. Um, maybe it was seen as something kind of high tech and different coming from coming from Rome. And in this way, he was kind of associating himself with this step up, step up in technology, but also this um, learnedness. You know, he was maybe a man of science. He was interested in these kinds of things, a philosopher. So in that context, I think we could, it's, it's quite interesting that he chose that object. But also sundials seem to have in the ancient world the kind of associations that we have seen with the sun throughout history, if you think of, I put a picture of Louis XIV up there, the sun king, this idea that suns, the sun had some connection with God's power, uh, the emperor, you know, when we, when we get into the, the first century. Um, in terms of evidence for this, we have a lot of literary references and also a lot of the inscriptions we find on sundial, sundials um, mention the names of emperors. So we have um, we have a, 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 an excerpt which says, after an earthquake, Tiberius went to a town and he, he, he donated money to fix a broken sundial. And you think, gosh, after an earthquake, surely he could be doing something else. But no, he was fixing the sundial. And I think this is really interesting because perhaps it shows a kind of connection between the empire, the gods, and sundials and telling the time. We also see this um, with a reused Egyptian obelisk in Rome, which again, uh, its shadow projected on a kind of meridian line. So it would tell you the time of year, um, depending on, on where, it's, uh, where its shadow fell. The Pantheon as well, there've been lots and lots of theories around this, but basically on specific days of the year, um, the light that comes through the hole in the middle of the Pantheon, the Pantheon roof, um, kind of shone out the front of the building through um, specifically made little holes on a specific day of the year, it lit up the whole entrance. So this idea that in the center of Rome, there were architects working and playing with buildings and playing with construction to maximize the power of the sun uh, is really, really interesting. So again, here, maybe we can understand why this guy chose uh, a sundial to set up. So we've already said, um, we've already kind of made this point too, that uh, perhaps he set it up because of some kind of wider symbolic meaning. But let's go back to kind of the practical aspects. 
this compared to a, making a bath complex or dedicating a theatre, this is pretty good value for money. It's a lot smaller, it's a lot more affordable. And for someone like Tobola, who had quite a minor political office, this might be what was within his, his budget. It was also really good publicity because um, people walking past, whether or not they were actually interested in telling the time, whether or not it was a sunny day or not, they could see his name uh, in an inscription across the bottom. So really, really good publicity. Um, it's also something a little bit different. As we said before, towns probably wouldn't have had you know, five sundials in a row next to each other because you only really needed one. So probably this was something that in his small town stood out quite a bit. In the local towns around um, in Tramna, they haven't found any sundials. So maybe also for a visitor from a different town, this would be something that they hadn't seen before or something they'd only seen in the capital city. So this is, I think, quite, quite an exciting thing to dedicate. Um, finally, I wanted to make the point that actually in a kind of records of inscriptions they found in the 1800s, um, they found a water basin with this guy's name on it, but a different political rank, this time Quaestor, okay? So this is interesting. Unfortunately, the water basin doesn't survive, um, but the idea that a kind of curved object was found with his name on makes us think, was it actually another sundial misidentified or reused as a water basin? Um, they have found these kinds of sundials kind of stuck against a wall in the medieval period and reused as as fountains, um, but kind of regardless of whether it will have two sundials or a water basin and a sundial, it's quite interesting that we see this guy rather like a kind of LinkedIn, you know, uh, post of I've got a promotion. When Tubula moved from Quaestor to um, Tribune of the Plebs, it looks like he put up a monument to celebrate this change of status. So again, really interesting. I think we're starting to see um, what he might have been doing. I thought this, this quote from Tramalchio um, from the Caterina Satyricum was, was really good. So this is a satirical um, tale and kind of taking the mick out of uh, this guy who is very vulgar and is throwing this extravagant dinner party to impress all his friends, but it kind of lands a bit, a, a bit flat. And he says, he's talking about his, um, his tomb. So he says, when I die, place a sundial in the middle of my tomb so that anyone who looks at the time, like it or not, will read my name. Now, I think here we're meant to read it um, in a kind of a funny way, because is he talking about the middle of his tomb, like inside his tomb? And then if he's talking about inside his tomb, where is the light coming from to read the sundial. So this fits very much with this guy's character. He's, he's someone who really kind of goes all the way, but without really thinking things through. But I think actually what's going on here is perfect for our situation uh, with Tubula in, in Taramna, because anyone who looked at the time in that small Roman town, like it or not, well it's not it, would see his name. I just want to conclude with something that I think is is quite relevant to um, all kind of all humanity subjects or any subject that um, invites you to study someone who lived in the past, which is that when we look at the past, we find a lot of parallels um, with modern day society. Here we've seen some kind of really human tales. So we've seen tales of publicity, of giving back to society, of promoting your personal or political status. We've seen a link between sun and power. We've seen people boasting about drinking. We've seen people getting bored during long talks, something I hope you're not getting bored with now. Um, but also, really, if we, if we think about what we've seen, this is really very, very different to our modern day society. We talked a bit about an elite obsession with time, but really they weren't telling time to a precise level. 
Um, if you think about how much our society has changed since the kind of the wristwatch or the mobile phone um, or something like electricity, which has profoundly changed our timekeeping and kind of scheduling um, systems. These are people who lived 2000 years ago. Um, so while picking out these things which are very human and very relatable, I think as we're studying the ancient world and all the fantastic and all the completely terrible things that they did, it's also a really, really good takeaway to realize how they're really not like us and their everyday lives were very, very different to the kinds of lives that we're living now. Um, I'm done, so I will happily take any questions and then I'll let you go to your next thing on time since we're talking about time people. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have questions specifically about this or? Yes, yes. What inspired you to like, like, like all of this? It's not something you hear everything. Yeah, it's completely wacky. It was honestly so. Um, going back to the the, um, the excavation, it was honestly just because we found this really, really cool object. It got picked up by the BBC, by National Geographic. It was uh, all over the newspapers. So we were super, super excited about it. Um, and But when we first saw it, we had absolutely no clue what it was. So in all honesty, it was just because it was something that really, really excited me um and was really different and you'll find that people for their in any subject people for their undergrad dissertations end up doing something that's completely unrelated a lot of the time to their courses um because that is that's your possibility to really kind of go beyond the syllabus and do something that that you're interested in yeah oh yeah Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys. So the question was really good question. It's variety across the empire. So, like, did kind of timekeeping change? So, I literally just looked at, at Roman Italy and haven't really looked at the rest since then. But what I did notice when looking at Italy was that there was a quite a big difference between Greece and Italy. Um, so the Italians, the Romans, as kind of with many things, kind of stole slash copied this technology from, from the Greeks. And the Greeks stole this kind of from the Babylonians. So a whole um, series of stealing and borrowing, but they did adapt it as they borrowed it. So on uh, our sundials, we also have these, uh, so I told you about these lines, which are the hour lines, but we also have the seasonal lines, which are these. And this is basically the idea that um, in the summer, the shadow gets longer and in the winter, it's shorter. So you can tell the season depending on this. Um, now in Greece, these were really, really precise. And this basically means your sundial has to be calibrated for your latitude. So you can't just, there's a story, uh, I'll tell you about this in a moment, but you can't just move one sundial to a different place because it doesn't work. It, the hours still work, but the seasonal lines don't work. So in Greece, the sundials you find are, are much more accurate. Um, in Romanistly, they don't seem bothered by this at all, which fair enough, you can tell if it's winter or summer, summer without looking at a sundial, I hope. Um, there's a story where Pliny tells us that um, the Romans were fighting in Sicily and they took back as part of their war booty a sundial and they stuck it up um, in front of a temple in Rome. Now this wouldn't have, it would have worked to tell the time, but it wouldn't have worked at all to tell that the, the seasons because it wasn't calibrated, but they didn't care so much. Um, yeah, yeah. So when you, sorry, um, when you were doing the um, dig, yeah. So, um, were you presenting in particular and just stumbled across? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that dig is 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 very very interesting. I would invite you all to kind of give it a Google and have a look at some of the pictures of things we found because found a lot of fantastic stuff. 
but we've done something called ge geophysical, a kind of geophysical survey on it, which to say very briefly is a kind of technique where you can scan and you can see things using magnetic radiation. You can see what lies underground. So when we're digging, we have a very, very good idea of what we're going to find. And there um, we knew we were going to find a road. Um, we actually didn't find it there. It, I think it's probably a bit deeper and we just didn't find it, but we ended up finding it years later when we weren't looking for it, but we, you know, we've kind of given up on it. We found it over here. So we were digging, uh, expecting to find a road. We ended up not finding a road, finding loads and loads of rubble um, and finding this guy. I was actually, I was sitting on it for like three or four days because we thought it was just a slab of stone. And I was kind of digging around this and so on. And at some point, uh, uh, my professor, who's this guy down here, said, come on, let's get this piece of shit out. We don't want this. It's in our way. And pulled it up, and then we all saw the inscription. So a, a hu hugely, hugely surprising find.